All right, we're in a series walking through the minor prophets. And like we've talked about nearly every week, they are called minor not because they are unimportant, nor because they are insignificant, but because they are shorter in length. There are some prophets that had longer messages, right? Like Isaiah and Jeremiah. And then other prophets had shorter messages like the minor prophets. You might think of them as ancient blog posts to Israel. And they were written basically after Israel had turned their back on God. And they point to a God who will redeem and restore that which has been broken. And so the minor prophets are good news. If you can look back on your life and think of any time when you've made a mess of things. If you've ever made a mess of things or made decisions that hurt you, your walk with God or other people, then the minor prophets are for you and for me because they speak to a loving God who will restore and redeem that which is broken. Uh, our encouragement is take as many notes as you can. If you've got your Bible, you can just mark things in your Bible, on your phone, your iPad. The heart is that uh, you'll have a bit of a study guide for each of these minor prophets that you can look back upon in the years to come as you study the minor prophets. So we have a bit of an understanding of what they are about. So let me give you some background just to, to write down. Amos uh, his name is the same in English as it is in Hebrew, and his name literally means load or burden, burden. So, so it could be that his parents had a sense that he would carry a burden for uh, the Lord, and, and he was from Tekoa, which was right on the border of Israel and Judah. We know there's the northern territory of Israel and the southern territory of Judah, Tekoa is right on the border, and that's where Amos was from. Now, here's what's important to, to note in your notes, is Amos was from the southern territory of Judah, but God sent him as a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. So he's from the south, but God sent him to the north. Now, he was not a professional prophet. In fact, in Amos 7, 14, when they're trying to kick him out of Israel because of his prophetic message, he actually refers to them and says, listen, in Amos 7, 14, I'm not a professional prophet. I'm not the son of a prophet. I'm simply a, a, a shepherd, uh, just a, a farmer of sycamore fig trees. And so what's really cool is you've got this unschooled and ordinary guy that God uses in incredible ways. And I don't know about you, but that is good news for someone like me, because I see myself as pretty just ordinary. And so this is an encouragement and a reminder to me that God delights in using ordinary people to advance his kingdom. And this is good news for anybody that just sees themselves as fairly ordinary, but we can be encouraged that God can use our life, our story, our journey, our gifts, to expand the kingdom of God. How incredible is it to think that God can use us to expand his kingdom? Next, I would say this, it would be important to, to be aware that, that Amos is kind of a, a say it like it is guy. Have you ever met someone who, who kind of just says it like it is? Raise your hand if you've met someone who they, they just say it like it is. All right, you, you might be sitting next to him right now. It, it can be good and it can be bad, but, but Amos, to be honest with you, was kind of a say it like it is type of a guy. What's evidence of that? If you want to make a note, well, we'll come to it. Amos chapter four, verse one. He refers to the upper class women of Israel as the fat cows of Bashan. So he's kind of a say it like it is type of guy. He prophesied somewhere around 760 to 750 BC. So he was a contemporary of Hosea, who we studied just a few weeks ago. What was going on at the time? Uzziah was the king of Judah. Jeroboam II was the king of Israel. And it was a prosperous time economically and politically, as well as militarily. But, but as we study Amos, there was spiritual depravity. There was oppression of the poor. There was 
immorality. There was idolatry and so much more going on. Above and beyond that, there was spiritual pride. Years before, Elijah, as well as Jonah, had prophesied that Israel would be returned to a place of prominence. And so that led the people of Israel to just think, we're good. And so they have this spiritual pride that led them into this spiritual and moral depravity. And so God sends this unschooled, ordinary dude with a powerful, pretty straightforward message for the people of Israel. So let's look here at Amos chapter one. We'll start by reading verses one through three. It says, the words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa. Would everybody say Tekoa? The vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, was king of Israel. He said, the Lord thunders from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. This is what the Lord says for three sins of Damascus. Even for four, I will not relent. So he comes out of the gate with some pretty intense imagery that really underscores the intensity of his message. And what I want to point out and make us aware of is he says he has this vision concerning of Israel, but he says what he will do in chapter one through the first part of chapter two is actually start by speaking to the surrounding nations. And we'll understand why in just a moment. But what I want to do, if you've got your Bible, what I want to do is just point out where those are so you can draw a line by them in your Bible because it's fairly important what he is doing here. So look at chapter 1, verse 3. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent because she threshed Gilead. Now, when it says three sins, even four, here's what that means. It means you've sinned one too many times and judgment is coming. So you see Damascus right there. Look at verse six. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. Look at verse nine. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not relent because she sold whole communities of captives to Edom, disregarding a treaty of brotherhood. Look at verse 11. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not relent because he pursued his brother with a sword and slaughtered the women of the land. Look at verse 13. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not relent because he ripped open pregnant women of Gilead in order to extend its borders. The, the, the Ammonites had a, a, a policy of, of expansion through extermination. And so they would just literally just kill pregnant women all for the sake of expansion. Look at chapter two, verse one, for three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not relent because he burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king. They, 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 they drove the enemy back and then tore up the graves, which was a sin. Now look at chapter two, verse four, and make a note of that, kind of a line there in your Bible. This is what the Lord says, for three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees. Now there's different types of people in the world. There, on one hand, you have the type of people who if you see a conflict in a grocery store, you see someone getting in trouble. You see action going on in a grocery store and, and you are so devastated by that and, and it's so awkward to you that you want to run the other way and get as far away from that conflict as you can. How many, if you see conflict going on, you want to run the other direction because you want no part of seeing what's going on there? Would you raise your hand? Okay, how many then are on the opposite end of that. You're like me. If there's conflict going on, you want to get as close to the action as you can to see what the details are. Would you raise your hands? See, that's me. If there's conflict or action going on in the grocery store, I'm going to go and pretend I'm looking at something on the shelf very close to the action just because I want to hear what's going on. 
I want all the juicy details of the conflict. The, the sense you get here in chapter one in the first part of chapter two is the Israelites are there and they're hearing Amos give all these prophetic judgments on all these surrounding nations. They're thinking, give it to them, Amos. Because again, they have this, this spiritual pride. It's almost like, like, like when you're hoping your spouse is listening to a certain part of the sermon. It's they're kind of like that going on. But here's what they did not realize. As he is speaking to these different neighbors, he is actually drawing a circle around Israel with them as the bullseye in the middle. I want to show you a map right here. It's going to come up on the screen. So here's what Amos is doing. He says out of the gate, this is a judgment against Israel. But then he starts by going to the surrounding nations. And so he speaks of Tyre and Damascus and Ammon, Moab and Edom and Gaza and Judah. And they're thinking, give it to them, Amos. But what they don't realize is they are at the bullseye in the middle of the prophetic judgments. And Amos is reserving for them a judgment that is three times longer than anybody else. So in our understanding of the book of Amos, that's important to realize in the first chapter and a half, these surrounding nations are putting a bullseye on the nation of Israel. Read it with me in chapter two, verse six through eight, where you can also put a line there in your Bibles. This is what the Lord says for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge in the house of their God they drink wine taken as fines. So you had immorality. You had idolatry going on. It says there that they, they, they sell the innocent for a pair of silver, these innocent individuals who should not have been sold, was sold. You, you see, this is the reality of what was going on at this time. Father and son would use the same temple prostitute. That's what was going on. It says that they lie down in verse eight beside every altar on garments taken and pledged. What, what does that speak of? Well, if you're poor and you owed a debt, they would give their outer garment as a pledge that they would pay back their debt. And it was against the law to keep that garment overnight because oftentimes if you were poor, that was all that you had to keep warm at night. And so what they were doing was breaking that law, keeping that garment overnight and using it to sleep by pagan altars. And so all this is going on. And God through Amos is saying, game over. This is not okay. This is not all right. They're probably celebrating by looking at the judgments on the other nations, but God puts a bullseye right on them and says, I am not okay with this idolatry and immorality. So that's in that first few chapters. He then shifts in chapters three through six. In chapters three through six, what he does is really detail the reasons for the judgment in chapter two. And so again, if you're, if you're taking notes, which I encourage you to do, what you might jot down is in chapters three through six, there are five messages of judgment that really detail why they were being judged in chapter two. Where do you find them here in Amos? Well, they're in chapter three, one, chapter four, one, chapter five, one, chapter five, verse 18, and chapter six, verse one. So three, one, four, one, five, one. And those start with, with thus saith the Lord. Then the last couple are woe to you 
in chapter five, verse 18, and chapter six, verse one. Let's look at chapter three, the first few verses there. Hear this word, people of Israel, the word the Lord has spoken against you, against the whole family I brought up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when it has no prey? Does it growl in its den when it has caught nothing? Does a bird swoop down to a trap on the ground when no bait is there? Does a trap spring up from the ground if it has caught if it, if it has not caught anything? When a trumpet sounds in a city, does do the people not do the people do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The sovereign Lord has spoken, who can but prophesy? So he starts out here by saying, he, he's asking these rhetorical questions. He says, well, when people walk together, typically they've agreed on a meeting spot as well as a direction to walk. He is saying that the, the, the former comes before the latter. Speaking of Amos's prophetic judgments precede the judgment of God. And then in chapter four, verse one, hear this, you cows of Bashan, or some of your Bibles might say fat cows of Bashan on Mount Samaria. You women who oppress the poor and crush the needy and say to your husbands, bring us some drinks. The sovereign Lord has sworn by his holiness, the time will surely come when you will be taken away with hooks, the last of you with fish hooks. So you, you, you have these, these kind of uh, preferred cows in Bashan. It was preferred pasture land. And he refers to these upper class women who they themselves did not oppress the poor. But they had these extravagant indulgences that really compelled their husbands to oppress the poor to meet the needs of their wife. So that, that was the type of oppression that was going on as he speaks to why judgment is coming on Israel. And he says that, that you will be led away with, with lions and fish hooks. We know by, by pictures on stones that when Assyria invaded them, what they would often do, and it sounds very, it's horrific, is they would take lines and then hooks and then run them through the bottom lip or their noses and would lead them away. So we know that this would actually come to fruition in years later. Next, chapter five, verse one. Hear this word, Israel, this lament I take up concerning you. Fallen is virgin Israel, never to rise again, deserted in her own land with no one to lift her up. A, a lament, what is key about that? That, that is a, a song that is a lament that is spoken of when a relative, close friend, or national hero passes away. And so this is the type of emotion that Amos has in speaking of, of, of Israel who, who think they're great, but they're actually spiritually dead. Now, what, what I think is important just to, to mention here, because sometimes we can look at the minor prophets and we can think, man, wh wh where's the love of God in all this? Man, wh wh where is the love of God? We, we, we do see just God's love and his hope. In fact, I want you to look where it says right here in, in chapter 5, verse 4. This is what the Lord says to Israel. Seek me and live. Do not seek Bethel. Do not go to Gilgal. Look at verse 6. Seek the Lord and live. If you go down to verse 14 of chapter 5, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say he is. Hate evil, love good, maintain justice in the courts. Perhaps the Lord God Almighty will have mercy on the remnant of Joseph. So what's so powerful as we see just, just throughout the minor prophets is we see the love of God, the hope of God as he's calling them back. 
And, and here's what I think is so important for us to get into our heart and into our mind as we study the minor prophets. As we just begin to immerse ourselves in these books, we begin to understand, we begin to see God's judgments as a form of his mercy. We see his judgments as a form of his mercy as he is trying to let us see where our sin is taking us before it's too late. We saw it a few weeks ago in Joel with the locust. He's trying to get their attention. We see here Amos speaking to it. God trying to get their attention to come back to him, return to him, seek me and live, return to me and avoid a much more significant, severe judgment down the road at the end times. And so God isn't trying to pay them back. He's trying to bring them back to him. And this is really the, the heart. And all of a sudden, this becomes huge. Because maybe we're at a place in life and, and things are not going well and things are falling apart. Maybe we're just experiencing some of the natural consequences of our life choices and things are kind of just, just broken. And maybe these are just gentle reminders to come back to God. To seek me and live. R return to me. Put me at the center so that you can experience my best plans and purposes. Jump with me now to Amos 5, 18. Here, here's the, the next message. Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That will be a day of darkness, not light. Now this theme of the day of the Lord is prevalent throughout the minor prophets. Now let me give you a, a definition, very important to, to write down, what, 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 what's the day of the Lord? When, when, we, when we speak of a read of the day of the Lord, really it, it's a special day, it is a season, really when God moves his plans and purposes forward. So when we read the day of the Lord, it's a series of events or special days or season when God moves his sovereign plan forward. Here's what's interesting. According to one commentary, some believe that Amos was one of the first to really introduce this proper understanding of the day of the Lord. So what they were thinking was, dude, the day of the Lord's going to be amazing because we're in God's good graces. And what Amos says, if you don't seek God, if you don't shift from your ways, it's gonna be a day of darkness and not of light. Now the last in, in, in chapter six, look what he says there. He says, woe to you who are complacent in Zion, to you who feel secure on Mount Samaria. The, the last thing that he speaks about uh, of why they're being judged is they had grown complacent. In fact, what, what's very interesting is they had all, they had all these long strings of military victories under Jeroboam II. So they thought that they were just totally secure. And what's interesting is, is what Amos does there in chapter 6, in verse 13, again, something else probably to circle or, or underline in your Bible, chapter 6, verse 13, where it says, you who rejoice in the conquest of Lodabar, here's what's interesting. Amos purposely mispronounces that name, Lodabar, in the Hebrew. He purposefully mispronounces it so that it means nothing. Here's why he did that. They had all these military conquests. They thought they were amazing under, under Jeroboam II. And what he's basically saying is all your military conquests mean nothing if you're not in right standing before God. And so he comes out with this judgment of the nations with Israel, the bullseye. 
And then chapters three, four, five, six, he just details the reasons for that judgment. And then in chapter seven and remaining, he really gives these, these prophetic visions. In fact, let, let's read the first few verses of, of chapter seven. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me. He was preparing swarms of locusts after the king's share had been harvested and just when the late crops were coming up. When they had stripped the land clean, I cried out, Sovereign Lord, forgive. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord did what? The Lord relented. Super important right there to underline in your Bible. This will not happen, the Lord said. Here's the next vision that we read about. This is what the Sovereign Lord showed me. See that in verse four? The sovereign Lord was calling for judgment by fire. It dried up the great deep and devoured the land. Then I cried out, sovereign Lord, I beg you stop. How can Jacob survive? He is so small. So the Lord did what? Relented. This will not happen either, the sovereign Lord said. This is what he showed me. The Lord was standing by a wall that had been built true to plumb with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord asked me, what do you see, Amos? A plumb line, I replied. Then the Lord said, look, I'm setting a plumb line among my people Israel. I will spare them no longer. And so what we see here, just out of the gate, that three of, of multiple visions in the last few chapters of Amos that God gives Amos. He starts by, by saying that, that there was a swarm of locusts. Now we know from our study in Joel a few weeks ago, from Deuteronomy 28, where, where it details the blessings of obedience and what happens if we turn away. And, and one of those judgments was God would use locusts to bring his people back to him. And we know that that, that took place. We, we studied that. But Amos, he prays and God relents. And then next, the next vision was a judgment of fire. Amos prays and God relents. Man, the, the, this right here, guys, is a powerful demonstration on the power of prayer. If you ever want a scripture that shows the power of prayer and that prayer works, Amos chapter seven is a great text. Because God, his punishment was, was, was just and right and sovereign. Amos prays and God relents. And so we can never underestimate the power of our prayers. And we can just go to God. And then he says, man, what, what do you see next? Well, I see a, a wall that's been built true to plumb with a, a plumb line. And here's what I've got now. I've got a a plumb line here. And, and there's a lot of you really amazing builders that would know exactly how all of this works, but got all tangled up here. But you know, all you builders know that you hang this thing and it just gives you this straight line so that when you're building a wall or doing some construction, you're, you're straight, you're strong, you're secure, you're aligned. And, and God asked Amos, what do you see? He said, I, I see a, a plumb line. Man, Israel had been, had been built aligned to God, but now they had just gone off. They were no longer aligned to him so that they would be strong and secure and built true. They had kind of just gone their own way kind of created in their own mind what's, what's right and what's good. And here's the deal. What was true in the eighth century is true today. And so here's a very important question that I wanna just encourage each and every person to write down in your phone, iPad, or whatever it, whatever it is you're using to take notes. Here it is right here. Who or what is my objective standard of morality. 
and truth. Who or what is my objective standard of truth? If we're a Christian, then God and his word is our only standard of truth and morality. It's, it's his word. Now we live in a world and a culture that will say, well, you just choose. You decide. And that's how we get people promoting gender identity. Whereas the Bible makes it abundantly clear that God has created each and every person beautifully. Man and woman, male, female, just as he wants you to be to fulfill the purpose and calling he has on your life. Truth is found in God's word. Homosexuality. God makes it abundantly clear. My best is man and woman under the sacredness of marriage. God makes it clear in his word. Abortion. God, God says, man, I have created life. God is a pro-life God and the Bible is a pro-life book and we see throughout the narrative of scripture. God just recognizing the, the, the prenatal phase of a child. You, you can look in Luke with, with John the Baptist and Jesus. You can look in, in Jeremiah's prophecy in Jeremiah 1. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. And, and so here's just, here's the challenge is we get to decide if we serve Jesus, we don't get to decide what serving Jesus looks like. Does that make sense? So we, we get to choose if we serve Jesus. But if we make a commitment to serve Jesus, then it is laid out right here in scripture what that looks like. And if we'll do that and live that out, then we will experience God's best plans and purposes and we'll be strong, we'll be aligned to his heart and his mind and we will look back on our life and be so glad that we did as we just live a life aligned to the true plumb line. He then says, if you wanted to, to just kind of bring it all out, chapter eight, verse one, was, was his next vision. This is what the sovereign Lord showed me right there. Chapter eight, verse one, a basket of ripe fruit, meaning the uh, ripe fruit spoils fairly quickly. And so their time is coming to an end. And then chapter nine, he spoke of judgment on the horizon. But I love, go with me now to chapter nine, verses 11 through 14. Verses, in that day, I will restore David's fallen shelter. I will repair its broken walls and restore its ruins and will rebuild it as it used to be so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name declares the Lord who will do these things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one who treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. And I will bring my people Israel back from exile. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. So I just love how we just see just the love of God and the hope just throughout seek me and live, seek me, return to me, experience my best, live life aligned to me. And then he says, return to me. And this is what I have on the future for my people on the horizon. I love what the NIV study Bible notes said about this passage. Here's what it said. This raises a hope underlying Amos' words one that runs through the whole Old Testament. From Genesis 3.15 on, God will bring blessing after judgment and will not ultimately reject Israel. 
And Amos looks to a future time when all the devastation caused by Israel's sin will be reversed. As he looks to, to hope. Hope is found in Christ. I don't know if you're the same way I was, if it was true in your home as it was in mine growing up, but, but every now and then I would act up when I was a youngster. And my mom, she could hold her own. Are we tracking? Moms can hold their own, right? But every now and then, she would drop this quote. Wait until your father gets home. And I will tell you what, it was potent, it was powerful, and it was effective because this was ingrained in my mind for the next few hours. Wait until your father gets home. There is nothing that could bring me back into the plumb line for God's plan for my life. And the phrase, wait until your dad gets home. I would just, my priorities were back in order shifted how I was talking and just behaving because I knew what's on the horizon. Here's what we see throughout the minor prophets. Here's what we know that they're just constantly encouraging us to, to focus forward. Look to the return of Christ because the Lord is coming back. The Lord is returning. And when we recognize that, just like when, when, when I was a kid and that was on the forefront of my mind and it just dramatically impacted how I live my life for those few hours, the return of Christ and what's on the horizon should dramatically impact how we live our life today. So Amos has called us to return to him and seek God, live a life aligned to him and experience his best. Amen? Would you bow your heads with me here? for a few moments and just in these moments I think these are just such an important powerful moments as we just say Lord what are you speaking to my heart about we don't just want to be people of information we want to be people of transformation allowing God just to, to challenge us and form us and shape us and mold us and in this moment would you just Say, Lord, what are you speaking in my heart about through your word in Amos? Maybe there's a moment of saying, God, I just, Lord, would you help me to walk in humility? Lord, I think we're all guilty at times of just maybe like the Israelites were doing, looking to other nations and what was going on surrounding them and just maybe neglecting their own heart. So Lord, I pray that we would just always start with us. And that you'd form in us your character and your heart and your mind. Lord, I pray that, that, that if there are people here today, as, as we know there are, and are watching online, and maybe they've drifted from you, I pray that in this moment they would say, Jesus, I, I wanna return to you. I wanna put you back at the center. I'm gonna seek you and experience your best. And I make that commitment in this moment. And Lord, I pray for every one of us. Lord, would you help us to, to stay true to your plumb line, to stay true to your word. Lord, I pray that, that, that something just powerful and significant would happen in our heart and mind right now that says, I'm gonna stand firm in my faith. No matter what, I'm, I'm not gonna just go with culture, go with popular opinion, just go with what's out in the world today. I'm gonna stay true to your word. 
I want to be aligned to you. So Lord, I pray that there's just powerfully, there would be something that would just resonate in our heart right now because we know that that is the best way. Your way is the best way. And so I pray that you would strengthen us and help us to live in a way that would bring you glory. Help us to recognize that, that, that you are returning, Lord. Help us to live with that in the forefront of our mind. Would you be glorified through our lives as individuals? Would you be glorified through us just collectively together as a church so that you could be magnified and we give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen.